Welcome to another CEO Wisdom Pod with Rebecca Edwards. Today is with us. Uh, she's an agency owner. She's uh, knee deep into SEO. She's also a gamer, uh, not as much as her husband apparently, but uh, <laughs> she's still into games. I was into games too. Uh, recently gave uh, them up, and nowadays I'm trying to gamify my business so much so that it does feel like an actual video game. So I'm excited to dive into these topics today, SEO, the role of AI and SEO agencies, of course, which still are my favorite business model up to this day. This podcast is brought to you by my podcasting agency, which is called podpair.com. If you want to start your podcast, scale one, monetize it, I am here for you. Uh, I bring the ROI into the podcasting game, podpair.com for that. Reb, welcome to the pod. Can you tell me a bit more about yourself and about your agency? Yeah, thanks. I'm Rebecca. I am an agency owner of a boutique content-led SEO um, team. I live in Eastern Tennessee, so I live like up in the mountains, not in a big city, which is great. Um, I've been working in and out of marketing since 2011, content since 2014, and I got really deep into SEO kind of around 2018, 2019. We actually launched our agency in 2019 as a content agency, and it's kind of grown from there to do more SEO specialty stuff in addition to content. So that's kind of the quick TED Talk notes or whatever people call it now. Right. Why did you um, started an agency and how did the photography business somewhat led to that? Yeah. So I did photography as one of the kind of, I was hustling a lot between like 2011, 2017 ish. And that was one of the multiple things I did. I think photography helps me a lot learning how to build a business, how to make people interested in what it is you have to offer, how to sell you as the service. Um, I learned a lot about like pricing and value-based pricing instead of like what somebody's worth like per hour um, in their work and learning how to base pricing differently. So that was helpful. It gave me tons of like really good customer support. I'd had some customer support background, but yeah, there were a lot of little things in it. I learned how to market a business. I learned that I didn't want to be a photographer. Um, I didn't like a lot of little pieces of it, but I think it was like a good intro. I was doing that similar or like around the same timeline as when I started getting into freelancing. And so I was doing like writing, writing emails and, you know, static page copy landing pages, stuff like that. And so it was all kind of, I was learning how to build WordPress sites and just soaking up a lot of knowledge. And so I would say one of the things that photography was, was a real help with is that I also, I feel like I have a, an eye for like design and aesthetics. And so that helps me a lot when I got into building websites. And now like as an SEO, a lot of what I do um, in certain seasons is like auditing sites. And so all of that kind of led into understanding UX and how people function and what they think of when they see something. And so it's all kind of amalgamated in a beautiful way. Give me a portrait of the agency. How many clients do you have? How much employees? What are you aiming for mm -hmm. on a results perspective? Mm, good question. Um, we typically carry eight to 12 clients at a time. Um, we're pretty particular um, in verticals, in types of clients we work with. So our primary thing is content creation. And so that's like 80 to 90% of what we do for most people is long form content. So we work with primarily B2C companies, although we've done several B2B agencies or like software or stuff like that, generally as projects rather than like ongoing retainers. So most of our clients are medium, small to medium businesses that uh, some of them like started with a local component and built their uh, SEO to the point where they can now like make money through other like, you know, advertising or through selling products that they didn't think that they could, which has been really cool. Um, we started out very much in the health sector, uh, just writing content about health. So like I can read up and down some studies. Like I used to be a compliance editor as my uh, last or not last, next to last in-house job. And I used to edit and review articles for like medical accuracy. I am not a medical expert, but I'm smart <laughs> and I can figure a lot of it out. And I love to just like 
gain as much knowledge as I can and expertise. Um, in terms of team size, we are very small right now because this year has been kind of rough. Like economically, a lot of our clients have just kind of said, hey, we got to cut budgets for this and that. So just transparently, that's tough. Um, I have like an in-house team of five and then um, we work with freelancers. I think at our max, like I was working with an in-house team of six or set six and about six to eight freelance writers just at any given time um, that we're doing that. So yeah, that's kind of what we look like right now. There's five, yeah, five of us. You, you think I can math, I promise. Um, and yeah, it's been really cool. We, we focus so much on great content. We've never done like link building or those kinds of things. We do offer some technical SEO services, um, but it's been a really small part because we found that if you can provide just super helpful, engaging content, um, Google rewards that. And then by that, you'll naturally build your links that you need and, and the, you know, the influence that you're looking for as well. Right. Um, that's pretty cool. Your content, it's quite good. I checked it out on LinkedIn. You get a bunch of likes and interactions. How can I do the same while staying my own weird self? So LinkedIn, I think if you haven't like been on LinkedIn in a while, a lot of people don't even realize it's such a, like a social platform at this point. I think that I decided that I didn't want to follow any of the, like, there's like a lot of people that put out, you know, how to grow your LinkedIn account and like, here's the five steps or whatever. And I just decided, you know what? I really like telling people how I learned something works or like my strategy behind something or my process behind something. I find that really interesting. And I'm just going to write as me. I'm not, I don't use AI to write any of my social stuff. I know people can, and that's fine, but I have always just kind of, I mean, this is so random. Them, but I literally feel so inspired in the shower in the morning. I'll be like, oh my gosh, you remember that thing I did for the client? And I will stand there and like write out a whole LinkedIn post. And so I don't know if that's TMI, but I get really inspired at like random times. And so I've tried batch creating content and all of those things. None of it works for me. And so I found that when I get hit with inspiration, like I write down like a skeleton idea or I'll just go ahead and write the whole post. And then I have found that a lot of people respond when I talk about content strategy. So I focused there. Um, LinkedIn, really like every social platform rewards you for posting regularly, which I've not been as consistent with. Um, but I've kind of found like a lot of people were, like I said, into strategy, into how to optimize a piece of content and little pieces of how that's done. Um, people don't really care when I talk about my agency, which is really funny. Like nobody care, nobody interacts with my posts when I talk about like agency ownership and those kinds of things. Um, and then I just decided I was going to be a little more of myself. And so I wear my rainbow glasses and those are my profile picture. And I shared a picture of my backyard the other day. And like when I adopted my, uh, most recent adoption, I adopted our second son. We, I was on LinkedIn and I thought, you know, the world should know this is great. And so I think being yourself is going to do a lot better than following some list of how to be successful on LinkedIn. Right. And the best posts on LinkedIn, usually they tell a story about yourself. And that's the constant that I see in your posts. They have a mm -hmm. nice image and they just tell the truth and then they finish up with a great value there. Um, so is there a structure that you recommend? Is there elements to the, the formula to get, let's say, more than uh, 50 pieces of engagement per post? Yeah. So I found that the slides format works pretty well. Um, I don't use it for every post because I think the, the key is really being varied in what you post rather than trying to post all of the same thing. Like polls were a big deal for a while and the algorithm on LinkedIn was pushing those to the top. It doesn't really anymore. Um, so at this point, I try to have a combination of like text only posts, I'll do posts with like one static image. And then if I'm going to use more than one image, I use slides. And so upload a PDF and do it that way. Um, actually, one of my most successful post formats, which is, I mean, it's worked several times, is starting out on X, Twitter, whatever, um, starting out there, posting like a long thread, and then using screenshots of every piece in the thread and creating a slide, you know, 
segmentation for that and writing a, a short description on LinkedIn about what it is. Um, you can kind of sneak in more information there. You can like go over the word count if you just do it that way. So that's been kind of cool. And yeah, I would say it used to be that like polls and GIF posts really worked out. I haven't posted a GIF in a long time, um, but I think that it, it probably comes down more to like, what kind of brand are you going to build? Cause like I follow a really popular SEO. He literally doesn't post about SEO. He posts memes and he jokes about the industry, but he never posts like you know, helpful content, but it's entertaining content. So I would say like, decide who you are, who you want to present yourself as online. And if that means posting a bunch of stupid memes all the time, and that works for you, that's great. I love being more of kind of a teacher. And so that worked for me. And I'm also bright and colorful and energetic. And so I try to use that in my writing. If you want to be super like professional, then be that way. I think it's more about deciding who you are than a formula. Yeah. Some kind of ikigai, what the market wants, what the market's ready to pay for it and what you're good at and what you can get mm -hmm. paid for it and so forth. So um, that is interesting. I'm wondering also, I, I'm seeing the prices on your website. You start at 1.5K ish. What's the return on investment on that typically after a couple of months? Mm, usually we don't, we, we have a structure that says before six months, like basically don't expect a whole lot. And that's because primarily we've worked with a lot of brand new sites. And so as they're building authority with Google, it's just Google's cautious and slow to build authority on a new site, which is fine. Um, ROI wise, it's so, I hate defining that in SEO. I'm so sorry. I know that's a terrible marketing answer. Um, but I would say like, we have one client who's been working with us for a really long time. When they started out, we were at the very beginning of our agency. And I think they paid us like $600 a month. I mean, they were getting as little as possible. We don't even offer anything near that price anymore, but they've been working with us for upwards of, I think three and a half years. And they use ads on their site to monetize what we give and or what we create. And so during COVID, they were very well positioned because they were offering telehealth services and COVID allowed them to offer them to like every state in the US. And so, I mean, they made, I don't know the exact numbers because we didn't, that wasn't like part of our contract at the time, but I know that they made several hundreds of thousands of dollars with clients and uh, consultations during COVID in that time. So it was like right place, right time. Um, programmatically, they make like, I think six to $8,000 just in ads revenue. And that doesn't include any of the clients that they bring in. So um, I know we had one company that we worked with for about two and a half years. And I think their first year, like I, this was another brand new site, their first year, they made, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand from sales. This was a, a e-com and the second year SEO like trackably led to like $1.2 million in sales of like an 11 or $12 million a year. So we've seen stuff like that, but because of how we're structured, I generally am like, Hey, we're here to help you like optimize your site, create great content. We're not here. Like I am not um, a conversion rate specialist. I don't want to ever sell myself as something I'm not great at. Um, I'm also not like, I can do a lot of data stuff, but I'm not an analytics whiz when it comes to a lot of that. And so when we meet with clients initially, we just kind of present it as like, we would love to know the ROI of what you're creating. We're going to create a strategy around relevant clients or customers that you want to bring in, but we are not specifically like reviewing and doing stuff with those numbers unless you bring us in specifically. So those two examples, like they have kept us up to date a little bit, but it's not like a super direct ROI. Unfortunately, it kind of depends on the product you're selling and a lot of little factors. It's a tough question uh, every time you get asked that, you know, because it's tough to calculate. Um, and me, I'm trying to strive near that formula on a daily basis, try to track all of my efforts and see what works and what doesn't. Generally speaking, mm -hmm. from the gut, you just know because the client is, is going to tell you, you know, just like your tire story that I saw on your yeah. LinkedIn, they patched up your tire. Well, obviously you're going to, you're going to tell them thank you and you're going to refer them clients, you know. Um, 
being there at the right place at the right time, how can we scale that? You know, because COVID, I mean, if you're an extremely fast executor, you're an entrepreneur with some times in, in your hand, um, you can start to telehealth and really scale it fast. Um, nowadays with trends still in the negative realm, right? Like with Ukraine and Russia, for example, and uh, Israel and, and Hamas nowadays, is it like, oh, I need to start a defense company and uh, <laughs> benefit from these mega trends? Like how can we be there at the right place at the right time? I mean, you, you're into this with keywords and trends. Mm -hmm. How do you go with that? Um, I... First of all, I wish that I was an expert on scalable business models. I'm not. I've done a pretty bad job about that because I've worked myself into a place where my agency works because of who I am and the way that I train my team. Um, I haven't quite learned how to duplicate myself perfectly. Uh, it's in progress, you know, but I think in terms of mega trends and things like that, I recently, for instance, like I bought a URL for a business that has been in the back of my head for a really long time. I have no plans to start it immediately, but the reason it popped in my head was because I was having a discussion with my brother, actually. Um, he's an author and my family happens to do a podcast. It's entertainment related. And we were chatting and he was talking about the book that he, well, book series, he's releasing book three now. And he was talking about something about finding a, a publishing agent or something like that. And basically it popped in my head again that like, I have an interest in this and I have some ideas for a kind of scalable opportunity and that kind of thing. And so I went and bought the URL and now I'm just kind of sitting on the idea and maybe one day I'll, I'll do something with it. But I think it has more to do with like when you create things or when you get good at things, I think both becoming amazing at what you do or what you know, and then being involved in trends, like being on, being on X, like read threads, read things on LinkedIn. Like I'm part of several newsletters. I'm super interested in AI, like literally everyone right now. And so I have, you know, four newsletters about AI updates that I get every single day and a video that I watch like once a week with updates. And, and then I think as inspiration hits, you can then implement the things that you've been learning and investing your time in, into creating something mega scalable. And beyond that, I don't know, like, I'm sure that there are lots of great ways to do that, but I think it comes down to like, I would rather not build something based on a trend. I would rather build something that solves like an obvious need and then do that thing really well and iterate it as trends change, like as things are needed in different ways, you know, like that's a little bit of that goes into my agency. Cause like I said, we started out just doing content creation and nothing else. And then what happened was I became more entrenched in the industry. I learned more about like, why this piece or that piece of technical SEO matter or different things like that and how to do strategy. And then I had clients that came in and they were like, Hey, we would like you to create content, but we don't have a strategy or our website feels like a mess. Can you please audit it? And so I had developed those skills and was able to iterate the agency rather than trying to just like, you know, rush to starting something based on something temporary. How are you utilizing AI in SEO nowadays? What apps do you use? What prompts do you mm -hmm. have and at what scale? Yeah, I use ChatGPT a lot. I want to get more into Bard because I think that I've heard it's become a lot more helpful over time. Um, I've also used Claude. It's good for some things, not for others. I use an AI app a lot that has nothing to do with that. It's a little different called My Mind, but it's like a notepad where the notepad kind of like auto organizes different things. And so I can save a URL or a quote I heard or a reminder for myself of something later. And it's kind of a cool way to organize that. But in terms of using it for SEO, um, I've developed a list. I think it's like a 14 prompt list i'm trying to remember um of creating a new article i hate every single ai article creation service i've seen but may, well with like one exception that's not public yet and so i am super particular uh i have always been that way that's what makes me a good editor but it's also hard to reproduce 
Um, so what I've done was kind of figured out how to feed AI information, just like I would feed a writer. And then I have it write like a section of an article at a time. And every single prompt for writing a section at a time includes like my full list of style guide options and like the things to remember. And I'm training it on, you know, only the data that I want it to use as much as possible. So I've been able to do that. I've been testing it out on a personal site, like a lot. Um, well, I was for a little while. I haven't done anything for several weeks, but I was just kind of like in there and I could ship a brand new article with like, I would go through and edit it, add scientific research, add personal stories and additional resources and whatever. I could have it from turning, like hitting the button to run a report in clear scope, which is just, I'm a fan girl. Um, one of the optimization tools I use and I could do it in two hours uploaded to the site with a header image and everything. So like I got the process down to that, which was pretty good. Um, we've used it a little bit for clients, but I feel like I'm so hesitant because especially with Google's most recent updates, experience is such a big part of it. And I have yet to be able to prompt in a way that I really feel makes it seem legitimate experience, which is fine because it's an AI. It doesn't actually have experience. And so we've used it for some client work, but I feel like those end up getting very heavily edited still. And so it may save a little bit of money, but it's not necessarily always a time saver. Um, it's just the difference of like, do I assign this to a freelance writer or do I try to write it with chat GPT, which is what we typically have used. Um, I've tried a couple of other apps. I don't want to like say anything negative about anything, but I have not been a huge fan of um, any of them so far. Um, but there are, there's one or two that I've tried that are going public. It's chat GPT constantly for like rewriting a paragraph, ideating little things like, you know, how can this piece of content be better? What would this potential customer want to know about this thing. Like I use it for a lot of stuff like that or to like do a lot of administrative work. Um, I was playing around with a client today. We were messing with like how it could combine multiple spreadsheets into a single piece of data and clean it up. And it took like a minute versus like an hour or two that it would have taken a human to do it. So I'm, I'm using it for a lot of like side tasks like that, but yeah. Oh, one more. I use Loom's AI features. They're so good. I'm obsessed with Loom. I don't like the way that they do like the timeline of a video, but everything else about like the the way that it describes what's there and creates a transcription um, and names the video and like can cut out, you know, pauses and stuff has been really cool. Yeah, I also like Loom a lot. So uh, watch out Vidyard. Um, thank you for being there today, Reb. Where can people find out more about you? Uh, probably easiest to find me on LinkedIn or X. So weird to call it that. Um, I am Rebecca creates on LinkedIn and Rebecca underscore creates on Twitter slash X. So those are the easiest. You can visit our agency website, Clara.agency for a little more on what we do, but like, don't judge because it hasn't been updated in a long time. <laughs> I'm Charles Cormier, your host at CEO Wisdom Podcast.com. That was Rebecca Edwards.